Hey, Brave Church, this is Dominic. I'm really looking forward to sharing God's word with you today. We're going to be looking at one of the most controversial things that Jesus ever said. I'll be sharing live at the campuses. And for those of you watching online, here's a video of the same teaching that I gave up in Portland, Oregon. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. On the count of three, let's say that verse together, I am the way. One, two, three. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much um, for this church. I thank you for what you're doing here. And uh, just the power of your word to sustain us and to change us. And I ask, Lord, that um, today you would just meet every single person here in a unique way. Uh, There's no way a sermon could do that, but your spirit can. And so we just ask that your spirit would move and work and you would give us a, a fresh perspective on the power of these words and your spirit would, would it make application in our life. So I thank you for what you're about to do. Thank you, God, for the way that you're moving in this community. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Hey, if you've been tracking with us through the Gospel of John, you've seen that there are seven different times where Jesus says, I am. The first is in John chapter 6. He says, I am the bread of life. John 8, I am the light of the world. John 10, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, what we're talking about today. And then finally, John 15, I am the vine. Now, the the, the phrase I am in in the Greek language is ego ami. Uh, Let me hear you say ego ami. And it's fascinating because it's actually the same words that God told Moses back in Exodus 3 when Moses, he saw this bush that was burning, and God said, hey, I have chosen you, Moses, to go and speak to Pharaoh, who at that time was the most important man alive, and I want you to go to him and say, let my people go free, because the children of Israel at that time were enslaved in Egypt, and God says, I want to liberate them. And Moses, though, was worried because he felt inadequate. Do you ever just feel inadequate? Do you ever feel like you don't have enough to fulfill God's call and dream for your life? He's like, there's no way I can do this. Moses was in search of a name. He he was looking for a source of authority. God, who who shall I say sent me? Who who are you? Because when Pharaoh sees me, he's going to want to ask, okay, what authority do you have? And Moses says, you need to give me that authority. You need to tell me your name. And so God responded, okay, you want to know my name? Here it is. I am that I am. And Moses is like, gee, thanks, that clears it up, right? And for hundreds of years, uh, people have wrestled with that phrase, trying to understand who is the I am? What, what does that mean? Uh, some would interpret it as the self-existent one. Um, some say it would refer to God as ultimate ra- reality or the source of being. But regardless of where you land on this conversation of understanding the I am, it is essentially a question in search of an answer. I am what? Who are you, God? What is your character? What is your nature? What does it mean to know you? Who is the I 
am. And then Jesus comes along in the gospel of John and he fills in the blank. He says, you want to know who the I am is? You want to know who the father is? The gospel begins. John one, the incarnation, Jesus, the word becomes flesh. He walks among us and Jesus as God, who is one with the father, he says, okay, I'm going to show you his character. I'm going to show you his authority. This is the I am. I am the door. I am the vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, most people, when they, when they look at these I am statements of, of Jesus, even people who would consider themselves secular or even non-Christian, uh, most people don't have a, a hard time with these I am statements. Like if you were to go out on the streets and just say, okay, what, what do you think about Jesus? Whether, whether they're Christian or not, do you think Jesus was in some sense bread for the hungry? I think many people would be like, yeah, yeah, he did a lot of good things. Did, did you see Jesus as being the light of the world in a, in a dark place? Oh, yeah, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Do you see Jesus as a good shepherd? Again, most people would say, yeah, th th that's great. Jesus, he did a lot of good for a lot of people. But there's one I am statement <laughs> that people do have a hard time with. There's one I am statement that really kind of gets underneath people's skin and causes controversy. It's one that I think in this moment in 2019, a lot of people like to ignore or maybe even see it as offensive. And it's the one before us today where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And especially this line, no one comes to the Father except through me. Notice that Jesus does not say, I am one of many roads to the divine. Jesus does not say, I'll show you the way to God as a religious leader or a teacher. No, Jesus makes an exclusive claim. He says, I am, ego a me, same phrase, Exodus 3, so it's a claim of divinity, but he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me, and this is the line that people have a hard time with because we live in a time, especially in a city like ours, where the prevailing ethos of our culture is pluralism. We're told that there is no such thing as absolute truth, that truth is relative, that truth is, well, whatever you want it to be. You be you. Live your truth. And it doesn't really matter what, what that truth is. The only thing that matters is that you tolerate everyone else's version of reality. And the best way you can tolerate them is for you not to talk about your beliefs or convictions, right? This is the culture we find ourselves in. In um, A while back, I shared with some of our gatherings, and I think it's worth sharing again, this brilliant poem by the English journalist slash satirist uh, Steve Turner. And he talked about where we're at in this pluralistic age. I'll just read it to you. He says, we believe in Marx, Freud, and Darwin. We believe that everything is okay, as long as you don't hurt anyone, to the best of your definition of hurt and to the best of your knowledge. We believe in sex before, during, and after marriage. We believe in the therapy of sin. We believe that adultery is fun. We believe that taboos are taboo. We believe that everything's getting better despite evidence to the contrary. The evidence must be investigated and you can prove anything with evidence. We believe Jesus was a good man, just like Buddha, Muhammad, and ourselves. He was a good moral teacher, though we think his good morals were bad. We, we believe that all religions are basically the same. They all believe in love and goodness. They only differ on matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, and salvation, right? <laughs> Brilliant. So at a surface level, like pluralism sounds like really progressive. Uh, it's very Zen. Uh, it's very Portland. But actually, when you begin to peel back some of the layers of pluralism, you find all kinds of contradictions. I think at the top of the list, as Steve Turner pointed out, all religions don't say the same thing. They, they, they just don't. Uh, they, they contradict each other. They have different takes on who God is and, and the way that you can know God. Take Buddhism, for example. Um, Buddha's last words were, quote, work hard to gain your own salvation. So these were the final words that he said before dying. Work hard. 
to gain your own salvation. Of course, that statement was a culmination of a lifetime of work in which he put forth what is called the Eightfold Noble Path, which is essentially a list of practices or disciplines that you have to implement in order to obtain enlightenment or eternal life or uh, understanding the divine. Interesting, his last words, work hard to gain your own salvation. Jesus' last words were, it is what? Finished. In other words, Jesus said, look, you can't earn your own salvation. Now, you can try, and you can try and fulfill all the laws and rules and regulations and practices, like all of that. But at the end of the day, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So Jesus shows up and says, I will do what you never could. I will live the sinless life. I will fulfill all the requirements of the law. I will die on a cross for you. I'm going to take your shame and your shortcomings and your failure and your hurt and your pain and your scars and your sin, and I'm going to die for that, and I'm going to bleed for that. And when he died, the veil was torn open. Heaven comes crashing into earth, and now as we come to Jesus, not based on our works or what we've done, we come based on his grace, that he loved us, that he rescued us, and now in the words of Paul, we are in the Beloved. Not work hard to gain your own salvation. No, the work is done. All that is left for us now is to believe that and receive that. And it, we call it the gospel. That's what changes you from the inside out. So this is just like one tiny example. All religions are not saying the same thing. Boston University professor Stephen Prothero, he, he writes this. No one argues that different economic systems or political regimes are one and the same. Capitalism and socialism are so obviously at odds that their differences hardly bear mentioning. The same goes for democracy and monarchy. Yet, scholars continue to claim that religious rivals such as Hinduism and Islam, Judaism and Christianity are, by some miracle of the imagination, essentially the same. And this view resounds in the echo chamber of popular culture. Interesting. Now, why, why is pluralism so popular? Why is that? Why is it 2019? This is the predominant view. I think one reason is that when we say all religions are true, this is just another way of saying that none of the religions are true. And if none are true, then really we're not accountable to a personal God. Um, think about it. I mean, let's just say for the sake of argument that religions are all the same, that, that it's the same doctrine, same theology, it's the same path to God. Well, there's only really two scenarios where that could be true. Um, scenario one is that if there is no God, and everyone's version of the divine is sort of a projection of the imagination. Think Karl Marx. You know, religion is the opiate of the masses. It's something that we invent to feel better about ourselves and the tragedy and chaos of life. So that's one scenario. Another scenario is that there is a God, but this God is really confused. <laughs> And he doesn't care too much about us. Um, the God of the philosophers, the God of deism, that God would just wind up the universe like some big cosmic clock, and then he would step away and do his own thing, go golfing or whatever. It's essentially like the force, right, in Star Wars. God is this impersonal, unknowable, intangible being that we really can't know. And if we really can't know this God, what does that mean? Well, it's back to scenario one. If you can't know this impersonal God, it means that you can live your life how you want to live it. Live your truth. Pluralism, I think, is very convenient, right? Nietzsche, he said, God created us in his image, and we've been returning the favor ever since. But there's a deeper problem here. When we say that there is no one way to God, that statement, by definition, is objective and exclusive. So I, I'm expecting all kinds of pushback today as the gatherings go on, especially for those who are like, yeah, you know, I don't believe this. Um, let, let's say after this gathering, you, you come up to me and you're like, you know, Dom, uh, that statement that Jesus is the way to God, for me, uh, it's deeply offensive and uh, it's not politically correct. And Dom, you need, to, you need to change your theology. And instead of saying that Jesus is the way to God, you need to say that he is one of many ways to, to God. You need to embrace pluralism. All religions are the same. Now, if we have that conversation, 
Um, what you've just done in that conversation is actually articulate a very specific take on reality. By insisting that I embrace that perspective, you're actually being very exclusive. By, by saying there is no one truth, that statement, there is no one truth, is an assertion of truth. By insisting that I shouldn't make universal claims, Jesus is the way, truth, and life, that is a universal claim. You see, the point I'm making, everyone believes something. E everyone is exclusive about things. Everyone has a world view. I mean, I mean, think about just how exclusive we are in different ways of life. I'm exclusive about what I like to have for breakfast. For me, I, I love bacon and eggs and hash browns and a big cup of coffee, uh, gravy, you know, downtown port, my favorite restaurant. I love it. My wife, on the other hand, um, she'd be happy with like a bowl of quinoa and sweet potato. Um, for the life of me, I, does, does anyone here like sweet potato? Oh my gosh. Okay. You all need prayer. Like afterwards, <laughs> we have a prayer room right over here. We're going to cast down that demon in the name of Jesus. I... I, there's something about sweet potato, like, oh, it, no, I love food. Like, there, there's so many different kinds of food. But this, this one thing, like, no. I think in the Hebrew, it's there. In the book of Genesis, it was the thing that caused the fall of humanity. That's a whole other <laughs> theological conversation. I'm exclusive about what I like to eat. You're, you're exclusive, too. We're exclusive about our health. If you saw a doctor this week, and he said, actually, you, you have a tumor, you're, you're not going to say, you know what? It's all good. He's just, that tumor's just living its truth. Who, who, who am I to like try and get rid of it or say it doesn't belong? No, you're, you're kind of exclusive in that way, right? You're, you're exclusive if you're dating about who you want to date. Like hopefully you have like standards of who's good and who's not. It's why you swipe right, right? There's certain reasons here why you're exclusive. And, and that can be a good thing. You see, the, the, we all have convictions, we all have things that, that cause us to have an intuitive, innate sense of what's right and wrong. But, but here's the deal. The question that John 14 forces us to grapple with is, was Jesus right? When Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life, is he speaking truth or not? Was this a true statement or not? Is Jesus the way to the Father or isn't he? I don't think there's a more important question to grapple with. Remember Matthew 16, I think, when Jesus had the conversation with Peter? He's like, hey, who do people say I am? And he's like, well, some say you're a prophet. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're like John the Baptist and you do a bunch of good things. And he's like, okay, but who do you say that I am? There is no more relevant, significant question than that. Oh, C.S. Lewis, he wrestled with this uh, in his book, Mere Christianity, which if you haven't read it, I highly recommend. And he makes this claim there that the words of Jesus force us to come to terms with who we say Jesus is. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg or a sweet potato, uh, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. This is such an important point. Scholars call this the trilemma. Is Jesus Lord? Is he a liar? Or is he a lunatic? Was he just crazy or deluded when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life? And it's important what Lewis says because he's making, making this point that when people give us a hard time for believing that Jesus is the way to God, um, and we hear this, I hear this uh, in our city especially, where people are like, you know what, you're so exclusive, you're narrow-minded, you're bigoted, whatever. Well, here's what we need to know. It's not like we came up with that phrase. 
Jesus was the one who said it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This wasn't an invention of people later on. Hey, let's create an exclusive religion. No, Jesus claimed to be God. And so the question is, was Jesus right or wasn't he? If Jesus was lying, if Jesus was crazy, then there's a whole lot of other things we could be doing with our time right now. Like we, we shouldn't be here. Why, why follow someone who is a liar or a lunatic? But if Jesus was Lord, then that changes everything. There's nothing better that we could be doing with our time than gathering to worship him and seek him and learn about him. And sure, it is countercultural for us in 2019 to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You're going to get pushback. You're going to get people upset with you. You might be shamed on social media. You might have relatives that want nothing to do with you. It's countercultural. But you need to know this too. When Jesus said these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life, this was deeply countercultural in the time he said it. Jesus wasn't just saying something that everyone agreed with. Oh, yeah, we don't have a problem with that. When Jesus said it, it was like a bombshell. It got him in lots of trouble. How so? Well, think through, first of all, the Jewish context in which Jesus said this. Jesus was born as a Jewish man. He was raised in Jewish culture. And in Jewish theology, they had a very specific understanding of this phrase, the way. When they heard the phrase, the way, it for them spoke of the rules, the law, the regulations of the Old Testament, or Torah, the writings of Moses. Did you know? that in the Old Testament, there are 613 commandments, 248 positive commandments. That is, you shall do this and you shall do that. 365 negative commandments. Don't do this. Don't do that. One for every day of the year, I guess. 613 in totality. Jewish rabbis and theologians called the Torah, the writings, the laws of Moses, the way. In Exodus chapter 18, verse 20, here's a good example. You shall teach them the law and show them the way in which they must walk and the work that they must do. Um, David, in the book of Psalms, he talked about this. Psalm 119, he said, blessed are the undefiled in the way. Let me hear you say the way. way. Who walk in the law of God. So he equates the way with the law. And there's a ton of other verses that speak into this. When they heard the phrase, the way, in first century Palestine, for them, they're thinking laws, rules, practices, disciplines, Torah. Jesus shows up and he says, actually, I am the way. In other words, I am the fulfillment of the law. All of those laws, all of those commands, at the end of the day, they're pointing to me, which means it's no longer about rules and regulations. Instead, it's about grace. It's about relationship. It's about intimacy. This is what the Bible calls, by the way, the new covenants. I'm in Jeremiah chapter 31. There's a beautiful prophecy that speaks of this day. God says, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant. Let me hear you say new covenant. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The old covenant was all about showing people the way. In the New Testament, the new covenant, Jesus is the way prophesied there in the book of Jeremiah chapter 31 and fulfilled when? When Jesus, we'll see it later on in the gospel of John, he gathers with friends at a table. He takes bread and he breaks it. He takes a cup of wine and he says, this is my blood. This is the new covenant. Jesus institutes the new covenant through his sacrifice, going to the cross, death, burial, resurrection, old covenant, show you the way. This is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to live. New covenant, Jesus says, I am the way. It's about relationship. It's about intimacy, not just knowing about me, but knowing me. A few weeks time, can't wait, when 
the final Star Wars comes out. Although I'm sure they'll find a way to come out with more. Um, I'm gonna take my daughter, uh, Amelia, to go see it. Now, when that day comes, I'm not just gonna show her the way. I'm not just gonna say, here's some keys, and here's a map, and here's my car, drive down Shoals Ferry Road, turn into Progress Ridge. I'm not gonna show her the way. Seeing that she doesn't have a driver's license, that would not end well. Instead, what happens? Honey, just be with me, right? I'll take you there. Let's get in the car together. I'll drive you there myself. We'll, we'll go into the movie theater. I'll buy you some popcorn. We'll hang out. We'll watch this thing unfold. I don't show her the way to Star Wars. I am the way <laughs> to Star Wars, right? There's a huge difference, a huge difference. So too in our relationship with God. Because Jesus is the way, it's no longer about trying to follow a religious map. It's about following a person. And that, by the way, is what makes Christianity so unique. When Jesus said, I am the way, this was countercultural, first of all, uh, to the Jewish context in which he found himself in, the theology, the practices, how they understood the way. But it was also countercultural. Oh, I love this point. Let's draw the circle wider. It was countercultural in the Greco Roman world in which Jesus lived. Back then, talk about pluralism. The Romans, Greeks, they, they believed in thousands and thousands of gods and goddesses that populated the heavens and the earth. Uh, there was the noumena, or the earth spirits. There was the leres and penates, the ancestral spirits. There were gods of the sky and the sea and the earth. And man, they were pluralistic. Everyone worshipped their own god. Everyone had kind of their own version of, of truth. And if the God that you're worshiping doesn't work out, like if he or she doesn't give you what you want, no big deal in that culture. Just unfollow, find a new God, and it's all good. Everyone was fine with that for the most part. But there was one exception. Although Rome kind of prided itself on being pluralistic and tolerant, they had one thing that everyone had to unite around. There was one individual that everyone had to worship. And we see this developing in Roman culture. They would take these altars. Sometimes they were portable altars from town to town, city to city. And every Roman citizen was required by law to stand in line in front of these altars. They would pinch some incense on the altar, and then they would say, Kairos Curios, Latin for Caesar is Lord. And you make that statement, Caesar is Lord. Yeah, sure, I'm worshiping all these other gods and goddesses in my life, but I do believe that Caesar is Lord. And you'd make that statement, you would receive a certificate. Now, there was one group of people that had a really hard time with that. There was one group of people who said no, because they believed there was only one who was worthy to be called Lord. They insisted that there was only one who was worthy of worship, and it was Jesus. And they believed that, that someday every knee would bow, every tongue confess that what? Jesus is Lord. Y'all been listening to the new Kanye album, I can see, right? <laughs> and that's what got him in trouble because they're making this exclusive claim. There's one Lord, there's one God, there's one King, and it's Jesus. And the, the Romans, they, they couldn't stand that. But it, it, here's another interesting thing, too. It wasn't just the exclusive claim of the early Christians that got them in trouble. It was also the fact that they were, check this out, radically inclusive. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, in the Greco-Roman world, it was a culture that had all kinds of boundaries and barriers of who's in and who's out. Very prejudice whether it was racism or sexism or socioeconomic boundaries. They said, these certain groups are on the inside. Everyone else is somehow on the outside. Now, the followers of Jesus, and you can check out books like Dominion by Tom Holland, uh, books by Rodney Stark, historians who unpack this. The followers of Jesus insisted on a different story. They came on the scene and said, actually, Jesus has broken down those walls, that no matter your background, whether you're rich or poor, slave or free, male or female, we are one in Jesus. All people are accepted. There is room at the table for you. 
And the powers that be in Rome despise the Christians for that. For example, I think of Celsus, who was a Greek philosopher. He said in one of his writings that Christians are, quote, foolish. Why? Because he said, and this is so sexist and racist, he said, because they accept into their company slaves and women and children. That's how they saw Christians. Christians, they made an exclusive claim that Jesus is the way, but they were also radically inclusive because they said all the boundaries and barriers have been torn down in Jesus. And in the first through fourth centuries, you can check out history, they were rounded up, Christians were, they were thrown into prison, they were tortured, they were fed to lions, many thousands lost their lives. Why? Because they really believed that Jesus meant what he said. They really believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. They believe that Jesus was God. They believe that Jesus was Lord. And they believed that someday Jesus would return and put an end to injustice and oppression and that Jesus would heal and restore all things. In fact, oh my goodness, this this could be a whole nother sermon. Don't worry. But I just throw it out there because I think it's thought provoking. When you study history, it was because the early Christians believed in the exclusive claims of Jesus that they had a heart for justice and reconciliation. How so? Because if you really believe that Jesus is the way to heaven, then you're going to be motivated to help make heaven a reality now. If you really believe that Jesus is Lord, then you'll want him to be Lord over all that's broken and messed up in our world. Martin Luther King Jr., he understood this. He said, the Christian gospel is a two-way road. On the one hand, it seeks to change the souls of men and thereby unite them with God. On the other hand, it seeks to change the environmental conditions of men so the soul will have a chance after it has been changed. That's huge. When we say that Jesus is the way, This is not just some hyper-individualistic personal thing. Okay, he's the way for me to go to heaven when I die. Okay, that's part of it, but it's more than that. We're also saying that he is the way for heaven to come crashing into earth now, which has all kinds of implications for society and culture. Now, again, you might argue, you might say, well, Dom, I don't believe that Jesus is the way. In fact, for that matter, I don't even believe in objective truth. I think the truth is relative. I think truth is just a social construct. Well, check this out. If that's really what you believe, if you think there is no such thing as absolute truth, then what you've done is you've actually lost your ability to denounce injustice. Why? Because if there is no such thing as absolute truth, then on what basis can you judge what is true? On what basis can can you make a moral statement about what a government does is wrong, or a country does is wrong, or a people group does is wrong? On what basis is it wrong? (laughs) On whose authority is it wrong? Where do you get those moral values from? Why is it wrong? It's only when you have a sense of what is true that, this is huge, it's only when you can get a sense of what is true that justice can happen. And for hundreds of years, followers of Jesus have insisted that there is such a thing as absolute truth, and his name is Jesus. So in the face of oppression and racism and sexism and persecution, they said, they dared to say, Acts 4, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So here's the question I want to leave you with today. It's a simple one. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus meant what he said? Do you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Do you believe that Jesus is the way to the Father. There is no more vital, relevant, important question that we all have to wrestle with than that, because how you answer that question is going to change everything. I read this article recently out of a cemetery, I think in Indiana, 
and they had this tombstone. I think we have a picture of it. And on this tombstone, they had this epitaph. Pause, stranger, when you pass me by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. How cryptic is that? And someone brilliantly came along and they wrote something on the bottom. You can kind of see, see it at the bottom of it. <laughs> they wrote, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> so good. Like, <laughs> who you follow matters. And, and I think the reason why most of us are here today is because most of us have found that there is no one like Jesus. There's no one who loves us like Jesus there's no one who heals us like Jesus. There's no one who saves us like Jesus. There's no one who redeems us like Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And that is a message that our city and our world is desperate to hear. Thanks for joining us and listening to today's talk. We hope that this message encouraged you. If you have any questions or want to get connected, visit brave.church. There you can find more information about our on-campus gatherings, as well as upcoming events and ways to give to support what God is doing through our church. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.